it's good to see all of you this morning. And as I heard Chris mention honorable, I'll have to divert from my speech real quick and tell y'all a story that when I got elected to the House of Representatives back in 2002, sworn into office obviously in 2003, I had a dilemma. The first major dilemma that I was gonna see as a new state representative and that dilemma was as any of y'all have seen the house floor it's typically crowded you got 150 members there's two extra seats for every single member next to their desk for their for their loved ones there's people behind the rail up in the rotunda people are in all the committee rooms watching it live stream and so my dilemma was that my beautiful wife we did not have children at the time my wife obviously played a major role in my campaign and me becoming state representative but then I also, my grandparents, two of my grandparents, my grandmother Hager, she was ill, had cancer, and probably wasn't gonna make a second swearing in and, and did not. And so I really wanted her to be there and I wanted my grandfather to be there. So I had a dilemma, I had three people, two seats. What do I do? So my wife is kind of a petite woman, so I devised the idea my grandparents would be in the chair and my wife, the chair next to us, and my wife and I would squeeze in my chair. And so we did, and I stood up, I took the oath of office, I sat back down, and here's where I had one of those moments as a husband that was, well, just dumb. I leaned up, I leaned up in my wife's right ear, and I said, you can call me honorable now. She didn't laugh <laughs> at all. Uh, I, I had told that in a few different speeches here and there that then when I got sworn into the state senate four years later, I stood up and took the oath of office and didn't have quite the dilemma because there's only 31 members. You got a lot more chairs around you for family members, parents, this and that, grandparents. We had our oldest daughter at the time, Claire. And so I stood up, took the oath of office. I sat down and guess what? I kept my mouth shut that time. <laughs> the look on my wife's face, she is a lovely, wonderful person. I could search the world over and over and really never find a more perfect spouse for me. But the look on her face when I said, you can call me honorable. <laughs> So ever since then, if anyone ever says honorable, I flash back to that look on her face and it just doesn't bring up fresh memories. But anyway, had, sorry I, I regress to tell you that story, but it still makes me chuckle every time I hear somebody say that. But what I was asked to, to do today is talk a little bit about the biennial revenue estimate, the revenue estimate that I gave a few weeks back as the first duty as controller of public accounts here in the Texas is that the Constitution requires that I give a forecast. And before I give this, I'll ask a quick question of you. Is there anybody in this room that can tell me to the penny or to the dollar amount, doesn't have to be to the penny, starting in about nine months, your budget, your personal budget, not necessarily there at the radio station or the TV station, any, any any of you in, in the businesses you're in, but in your personal household, could you give me the exact dollar amount of how much money will come in to your budget and end two years after that? Two years and nine months. Can anybody tell me exact dollar amount? I've asked that question over and over and I had one person at the TxDOT speech last week raise his hand and I've never had anyone raise their hand because I tell them if, if you can, I want to hire you to be on my revenue estimating team. <laughs> and, and I say that jokingly, but it's a job that we take very, very serious. It's a job that is somewhat almost impossible to get to the exact penny, to get to the exact dollar. Now take a state that has over 26 million people, extremely diverse in all the different sectors of the economy that we have today. We have over 500 people moving to this state, more than leave every single day. <laughs> It is amazing, the economic engine. If you look at the state of Texas, and I mentioned this in the BRE, if you look at the number of jobs that have been created in Texas since 2007, since the last recession, I mentioned it's almost 1.2 million. And then if you look at the other 49 states in the nation, and it's unfair to combine them together, but just to make an illustration purposes, they're still down almost 300,000 jobs. It is amazing the number of people that are moving to Texas. I made one comment during the speech to talk about the number of jobs that have been coming to Texas in just my first week of the administration. And so 
even though I, I joke just half-heartedly how difficult the job is, it's one that we take extremely serious. When I was on a vacation with my wife last year, it was one thing that I needed to do after traveling the state over and over and over and with three young children, almost a 10-year-old daughter, a six-year-old daughter, and a, and a six-year-old son, it was pretty important that my wife and I went out of town and by the third morning, she noticed there was a habit. I got up, I was reading articles very early in the morning, sending emails back and forth with my revenue team, and by the third morning, she got to where she would ask me, she'd say, so, what is oil prices doing today? I was fixated, not just on the whole economy, but narrowing down really on oil. And I think you had mentioned it when you were talking briefly. If you look at the revenue estimate that we gave this year, revenue for general purposes, as I mentioned, is $113 billion. That is an unbelievable amount of money when you talk, put it in perspective compared to other states in our nation and many countries actually. At the end of this biennium, as in the end of August, we projected that there will be $7.5 billion in excess than what was certified in the last budget. So the economy has grown so much in the last two years that when the conclusion of this biennium, there'll be $7.5 billion above what we thought we would have. Then you also have to take into account that money that will be transferred over to the rainy day fund, as well as money that will be transferred based on the constitutional amendment that we as legislators voted on last session and then we as voters approved last November for transportation funding. So now half of those dollars rest in the rainy day fund, half of them go over to fund six for transportation. So you have to take $5 billion out and estimated in the upcoming two year budget for those transfers. So when you take 7.5, plus the 113 that is projected to come in in GR related dollars minus the 5 billion then that gets us to the dollar amount that we will have left over and so therefore we projected the 113 billion that the legislature has you also the part of the number that we don't talk about in the revenue estimate but it's really important to know if you take your federal dollars other related dollars and GR dedicated dollars that's another $110.5 billion. That's not a number that we necessarily highlight in the BRE in part because the legislature, they spend the dollars, but they don't have as much, they don't really have discretion over those dollars and those expenditures. I had mentioned very clearly then and have continued that we project that Texas economy will continue to grow, but much more modestly than what we have grown over the last several years. And the reason in part is because of the oil prices and the shell plays. There's been a lot of questions of me of what is the price of oil that you used finishing out the rest of this year through the end of August as well as starting out for the next two years during the press conference and I've talked about this a significant amount. If you look at the state economy and what we've brought in in dollars for oil per barrel, there's been about five months of $80 oil and so therefore if you take the remaining seven months and have roughly $52 oil, then you'll get to the number that I project that we're going to continue to have, which is $64. I had a lot of people right after the revenue estimate, a lot of members of the legislature, a lot of people asking questions, said, well, Quake Glenn, oil is around $50, and you said it's $64. How's it going to get up to $64 this month and over the course? One well, part of that, it's weighted based on the previous five months that have already collected of $80. And then we project that it will continue at roughly $64 for the first year of the biennium and then ticking up to just below $70. I've had several people tell me, how do you project oil prices? And I've told them it's really easy. Oil prices are really easy to determine. The problem is they're easy to determine in hindsight. I think there was a story that was written a few weeks ago about controllers and how close have they been on oil prices and it's roughly been about $20 barrel off. If you look at the different, in the first day when I gave the revenue estimate right before, I think it was Goldman Sachs, if I remember correctly, they cut their average price for this year roughly from the high 70s to $39. $40 off the price in one day. If you look at BP, not to call out Pacifics, but they are looking at $40 to $50 actually this morning. 
uh, the OPEC minister, chairman, if I remember correctly, had mentioned the bottom somewhere around the $45 to $55 range. And so this morning, oil prices have ticked up slightly based on those comments that it appears as though from an OPEC perspective that we've reached almost the floor. Now, no one knows exactly, but taking into all, how did we get there? Whether it's oil prices or whether it is any data that we put into creating the revenue estimate, that is not just my team internally, that's a numerous amount of conversations that we have with people from various industries around the state of Texas, people that we talk to on a daily basis, that I talk to on a daily basis, to try to make sure what is the feel of the economy out there. I'll give one example. Earlier this year, I guess it was last year now, I was touring a facility, some facilities in El Paso, so companies on both sides of the border. And it was interesting, some of the brokers that I was dealing with because they broker the, the freight back and forth across as their job and get it to wherever it's going throughout this country or around the world. And they were talking about how they can feel a downturn or uptick quicker than you actually see it. Why? In part because companies get the feel of what's going on and so they adjust their purchases up and down accordingly. It actually made somewhat of a sense to me, but until you get out there among the people and you start seeing what's going on, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to get these ideas. And so it's important that we talk to a lot of different people is my point. In fact, as I had mentioned in the BRE, that in the first week of my administration, we had what we had known, 4,000 new job announcements in Texas. Last week was another 160, 50 people, 650 new jobs here in Texas. Just in the first three weeks, it has been roughly 10,000 job announcements here in Texas. So a lot of people want to f focus specifically on oil and gas prices. But again, my point is, is this is a very diverse economy, a lot of different sectors, and Texas is going to continue to grow in my projections, but at a much more modest rate than what it has in the past. Now, one of the things that I would like to point out is volatility in two of the streams of revenue that play a very large part into the revenue estimate, sales tax and severance taxes. If you look at the decade 20 years ago to 10 years ago, you will see that sales tax receipts grew every single year. It grew from anywhere 4% to 10%, but it grew every single year. Now if you take the last 10 years, there were wild swings up and down. Swings, significant downturns, swings of significant upturn. And if you also look at oil prices or what dollars that were based off of coming into the treasury off of those oil prices, at the exact same 20 year to 10 year look, relative stable prices of only 19 to $34, but they were relatively stable. And then if you look at the last 10 years, again, you've seen wild swings up into the roughly 150s all the way down to dollars that we are seeing today and a little bit lower. So my point of saying that, when I gave the press conference and continue to make that point, it just means that we have to be judicious in continuing to monitor the economy every single day. And to give a good, clear revenue forecast, it's not just those factors that come into play, but it's also other factors. Are there lawsuits that could have a significant impact on the Treasury? as in a dispute over the way the tax is being applied? Are there changes that the legislature might have? Are there changes in the way we handle our auditing practices? And so therefore you have to take all of these factors into play in, in short. So to sum up, if you look at the state economy, it continues to look like Texas is gonna to continue to shine bright. Not quite as bright as we've shown in the last few years, but I think Texas' future is going to continue to be extremely bright, not just today, but in the coming next two years. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Complaints, you can give them to your chairman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do policy. We do have two microphones standing right here if anyone wants to step up and ask you questions. All right, calm crowd. I like that. We'll save that for when I come visit you another time. So uh, <laughs> thank you all for letting me be here. It's good to see you. 
And if you need anything from my office, please let us know anytime. We're happy to work through any issues that you have. May God bless you. Bless the great state of Texas. Thank you.